Let's turn now in our Bibles to Acts chapter 5. Tonight we begin with verse 17. The purity of the early church has been preserved by the sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. It was dramatic, it was decisive. Two people are dead, but a pure environment for the Holy Spirit to work has been maintained. And as a result, there's a great revival going on in Jerusalem. People from all over the countryside are coming and being healed of all manner of sicknesses. God is at work in a very powerful way. But whenever God is at work, you can expect Satan to try to fight it. But what usually surprises us is the fact that Satan so often fights from within rather than from without. And oftentimes it is from religious circles that the opposition comes for the work of God. I think of how when God was working and continues to work here, but in that beginning of the work of God, back in the uh, early 70s, how much opposition came to us from other churches. And as is the case tonight, the opposition was sort of sparked by jealousy. And so we find that as God is moving in such a powerful way, then we read in verse 17, when God is moving mightily in the midst of the people, hundreds are coming to the Lord. Then the high priest rose up and all they that were with him, which is the sect or the heresy of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation or jealousy. We're told that they were of the sect of the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the spiritual liberals of that day. They did not believe in the resurrection from the dead. They did not believe in spirits. They did not believe in angels. They were purely materialist, humanist. And the religious system had become a political machine. I read in the magazine this past week that the World Council of Churches is running in the red. I think that's very significant because they espoused almost every one of the red communist causes. They ought to be running in the red. Uh, they, they have been for a long time, but they just didn't know it. Uh, the National Council of Churches, of course, has been controlled by the liberals. Uh, they were much like the Sadducees, not much that they really believe in as far as biblical truth is concerned. Uh, they have become a political action group who lobby and support for almost every liberal cause in the name of the church, claiming to represent the church before the government. But any relationship between the National Council of Churches and true biblical Christianity is purely coincidental. But they are the ones that so often are opposed to the work of God. Uh, recently, of course, we read you some reports concerning the group of churches in Chicago, of which most of them were related to the National Council of Churches, and how they wrote to the Southern Baptists who were planning con a convention in Chicago and asked them not to come for fear that they would seek to evangelize Hindus and uh, Muslims and people of other religious persuasion. And they said that that would only inspire hate crimes and discrimination. Uh, tragic that so often uh, the opposition comes from within the religious circles 
rather than outside. When Satan attacks us, we're not surprised. When he uses others within the church to attack us, then he blindsides us many times. We're told that the reason for their opposition was jealousy. You know, we have to guard against jealousy. We need to have a broader picture of the whole body of Christ. If God is blessing in another church in the community who are truly preaching Jesus Christ, we should be rejoicing rather than finding fault with their methods. Jealousy over the work of God in another person's life or in another ministry, is an exceeding wicked thing. I think of when the disciples came to Jesus, and John said to him, Master, we saw one casting out devils in your name, and he would not follow us, so we forbid him, because he wouldn't follow us. And Jesus said, don't forbid him, There's no man who does miracles in my name who can be speaking evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. And we need to realize that. That we are not really in competition with other churches. That we should all of us be working together for the common cause of the kingdom of God. And it is so sad when we seem to get just where we can see only what God is doing in our midst and we can't see what God is doing in other churches and rejoice in the whole work of God throughout the entire community uh, rather than thinking, well, why would they go there instead of here? Uh, That's not the attitude that the Lord would have us to have. And that is what was happening in this case They were jealous because of the number of people that were coming and getting excited about serving God and following after the Lord because they weren't coming through them but were being gathered around the apostles. So they laid hands on them, we read, and they put them in the common prison. Now, There are three instances recorded in the book of Acts where the believers were put in prison and God miraculously delivered them out of prison. This is the first of the three instances. We are told that the angel of the Lord at night opened the doors and he brought them forth And he told him to go to the temple and to speak all of the words of this life. I love that commission. Go right back to where you were arrested and speak to the people all of the words of this life. How do you stop men like this? The answer is, you don't. You can't. And so here they go right back to the place of their arrest. And they speak in the people. And early in the morning, they're back there teaching the people there in the temple the words of this life. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life. And that more abundantly. And what a beautiful life we have in Christ. And that's what we have to share with others. The life that God has given to us in and through Jesus Christ. Share with them. Speak to them of this life. So, the first deliverance. And and this is interesting. It just uh, tells us that... uh, the angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them forth. In the 12th chapter, 
We read how Herod put James to death. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he had Peter arrested. And he intended to bring Peter forth and, of course, pronounce the sentence of execution for Peter in order to further ingratiate himself with the Jewish community. But when he had apprehended him, verse 4, he put him in prison and he delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after the Passover to bring him forth to the people. And Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. I mean, this is maximum security. I mean, chained to two guards, and the guard in front of the door... Uh, and uh, so, behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him. A light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side. Peter was asleep, remember. He hit him and said, Arise quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird yourself, bind on your sandals. And so he did. And he said unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and he knew not that it was true, which was being done by the angel, but he thought he was having a vision. He thought he was dreaming. This is quite a dream, you know, I'm being freed. And when they were past the first and the second ward, they came into the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and they passed on through one street and forthwith the angel departed from him. Suddenly Peter realizes it's not a vision. I'm actually free. And so we see the miraculous way in which the angel of the Lord delivered Peter uh, in that particular imprisonment. The third deliverance by divine activity is found in the 16th chapter of Acts, beginning with verse 22, where Paul and Silas are preaching in Philippi. And the multitude who was stirred by the people, rose, Jews, rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off, tore off their clothes, and commanded that they should be beaten. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Not going to let these fellows escape. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed, and they sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all of the doors were open, and everyone's hands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, waking out of his sleep, seeing the prison doors open, drew out his sword, and would have killed himself, because he supposed that the prisoners had all fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, we are all here. Then he called for a light, and he sprang in, and came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And so we see three different times by divine intervention in a miraculous way the apostles were freed from prison. I note that it was never the same way. It was always divine intervention, no doubt. But God didn't do it the same way in all three cases. 
I do not believe that God wants us to try to pattern him, to create special formulas, to say, well, God works in this way. We're prone to do that, you know. We're prone to hear someone give a testimony of how God worked in their life, their response, their reaction, their feelings. And then we think, well, that's the way God works. And I start looking for a particular feeling or an emotion. Uh, and when I don't get that same feeling or emotion, I sometimes feel a little cheated. Well, you know, God didn't do that for me. He did it for them, but wonder why he didn't do it for me. But God doesn't want us to try to establish the framework in which he works or to put the limitations on God. And, and I like that. God works in a variety of ways in each of our lives. And God knows our own particular idiosyncrasies and he knows our needs and he ministers to us according to our own personalities and, and our own makeup. And, and thus we see God working in a variety of ways and yet the results are the same. Always they were delivered from the prison. Now, there are other cases where they were put in prison and were not delivered, which indicates to me that God had a purpose for their being in prison. It's wonderful when God delivers, but it's also wonderful when he doesn't deliver because he has a broader purpose plan that he's working up. And so we know that later on, Paul was imprisoned again, but there was no divine intervention. He spent a couple of years in Caesarea under house arrest before he was sent to Rome as a prisoner. And there in Rome, he was in prison waiting for his appeal to Caesar. And so God didn't set him free at that time. But God set him apart so that he could write what are known as the prison epistles. And so today we have these wonderful letters that Paul wrote to the churches while he was in prison, had time on his hands, and so he wrote to the churches. But today we're blessed and we're benefited because of Paul's imprisonment and, and God not releasing him having worked out a broader plan and a broader purpose in his life by allowing him to remain imprisoned. God doesn't always intervene in a miraculous way. But if we are open to him, God will always work in us his eternal purposes, and that's the main thing. Not that I'm delivered and have a testimony of deliverance from prison, but I think that the testimony of God's ministry to me in prison can be as powerful as a testimony of God's deliverance from prison. And so early in the morning, having been delivered, we find them back in the temple speaking to the people the words of this life. Meanwhile, the high priest has called a special council. The supreme religious council in Jerusalem. And they convened early in the morning. And so they sent the guards to the prison to bring the apostles that they might stand before them. And when the guards returned empty-handed, they reported that they had found the prison secure. Gates were all still locked. The guards were standing at the doors. But when they came to their, sail, their cells, the apostles were missing. <laughs> I can just picture it. They're going to bring them to court. And so the guards, you know, open the gates, stand back, and everything's in order until they get inside and, the, and, and there's no one there. And now they're faced with a new problem. 
if word of this leaks out to the people, no telling how far it will go. And so they were wrestling with how to develop the spin to this story to keep the public deceived and in the dark. And as they were trying to figure out just what are we going to say to the public, you know, someone came in and announced to them that the men that they were seeking were standing in the temple teaching. And so, again, they're faced with the dilemma, how do we stop their witness? Obviously, their threats did not work. The first time they were arrested, they threatened them not to speak anymore in the name of Jesus. <laughs> it's interesting, they wrestled with the issue of how to get the message from leaking out. Today we work with the problem of how to get the message out. Uh, but it was so dominant that they were trying to put the lid on it. The captain of the temple guard was ordered with his officers to go and bring them without violence because they feared the people. There was a very popular movement and, and the, the general public was amazed at what they were seeing, the different miracles and healings that uh, were being wrought by the Holy Spirit. And so the officers were afraid that if they tried to bring them with force, bring them violently, that it would create a riot and they themselves would be stoned. And so they brought them peaceably to stand before the council. And immediately the high priest said, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? Didn't you hear what we told you? He said, Behold, you have filled Jerusalem with this man's doctrine, and you intend to bring his blood upon us. I notice a couple of interesting things here. First of all, the admission of the enemies of the church concerning their success. They've been very effective in their witness. They have filled Jerusalem with the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Isn't that a glorious charge? Don't you wish they could charge us with that? <laughs> We're doing our best. We'd love to fill the city with the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And yet there are so many who have not heard. And so the accusation, you have filled the city with this man's doctrine. But then second is, you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Now it is true, when Peter preached, he was very straightforward about their guilt in denying Jesus as the Messiah and demanding that he be crucified. In Acts chapter 3, as Peter is preaching to the crowd who had gathered as the result of the healing of the lame man, Peter said to them, The God of Abraham and of Isaac, and of Jacob. The God of our fathers have glorified his son Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just, and you desired a murderer to be granted unto you. And you killed the Prince of Life, whom God has raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses." And now, brethren, I know that through ignorance you did it, as did also your rulers. Implicating the rulers in the crucifixion of Jesus. 
when Peter was facing the council the first time as the result of this miracle. In the fourth chapter, beginning with verse 8, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said unto them, You rulers of the people and elders of Israel, this same council, if we this day are examined because of the good deed done to the impotent man by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all of the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, talking to the rulers, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught by you builders, which has become the head of the corner. And so Peter lays the blame for the crucifixion upon them. And now they're complaining. They say, you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But isn't that what they actually asked for? Reading, in, reading rather in Matthew chapter 27. When the morning was come, all of the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and they delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented. And he brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and the elders. And he said, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? It's your problem. And so he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went out and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It's not lawful to put them into the treasury because this is blood money. And they took counsel and they bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in them. Wherefore that field is called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet who said, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they the children of Israel did value, and gave them to the potter's field, as the Lord appointed me. And Jesus stood before the governor. The governor asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, You said it. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate said unto him, Don't you hear how many things they are witnessing against you? And he answered him, Never a word, inasmuch as the governor marveled greatly. Now at that feast, the governor was prone to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had a notable prisoner called Barabbas. And therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. Interesting, isn't it? The same jealousy that caused them to deliver Jesus. They, you see, he was drawing away people from them. They wanted to be known as the religious leaders. They wanted to be looked up to as, you know, God's representatives. Though they miserably represented God. And when people were following after Jesus, they were determined that he had to be put to death. And Pilate picked up on this. He realized that it was jealousy that had prompted them to bring Jesus before him. And as we read in our text tonight, there in the uh, book of Acts chapter 5, it was because of their jealousy of the great numbers of people that were coming and listening to the apostles and receiving Christ that they had arrested them. So uh, that same jealousy or envy was still at work months later when they are arresting the apostles. Uh, and so when he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him saying, 
have nothing to do with that just man. For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called the Messiah? And they all said unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil has he done? And they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. And when Pilate saw that he could not prevail, but a tumult was made, he took water, and he washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. I want you to see to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be upon us and on our children. And so he released Barabbas to them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Their tragic request, when Pilate begged to be freed from the blood of Jesus, an innocent man, washing his hands there before them, declaring, I'm innocent, see ye to it. They cried out, his blood be upon us. Now they're upset. They're upset with the disciples. And their accusation is, you're trying to bring this man's blood on us. The very thing that they said. You know, it's sort of tough when our words come back to haunt us. <laughs> when we make rash statements and then we have to somehow face them again. And here they are in this predicament. They had said, his blood be upon us and our children. And now they are upset because they are saying to the disciples, you intend to bring his blood upon us. But it should be noted that his blood is really upon us because we are guilty of putting him to death. If I understand the scriptures correctly, he died for my sins. God laid on him the iniquities of us all. And so we are all of us culpable as far as the death of Jesus is concerned. We all have a part in it because we have all sinned. But the wonderful thing is that God, through his death, has made provision for the forgiveness of sins and hence eternal life for those who will believe. And so once again tonight, we have the broken bread and we have the cup. The blood of Jesus Christ, he said, this is my blood which is shed for the remission of sins. This is my body which is broken for you. And as we, guilty as we are, have come to recognize and to receive God's provisions, we rejoice tonight in the fact that the blood of Jesus Christ has provided cleansing for our sins. And so tonight we want to partake again of the broken bread and of the cup in remembrance of the suffering of Jesus and of the death of Jesus for us. And as we do, may the Spirit of God just speak to our hearts in a very powerful way, causing us to realize that we are all of us guilty. We have all of us sinned. We have all of us come short of what God would have us to be. But God laid on him the iniquities of us all. And by his stripes, we are healed. And through his blood,
the price was paid for the remission of our sins. We'll ask the men to come forward at this time to distribute to you the broken bread and then the cup. As you receive the bread, hold it until we've all been served, and then we'll partake together.